Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, good. Let me share my screen. Um, I have a few slides. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Can you see my slide deck? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Indeed, um, I'm going to focus as I come from UNHCR on the policy elements and um, I'll speak about two uh, pieces of work and let me put on my time uh, here so I can be seven minutes I'm supposed to be so um, yes so um, thanks again for for this opportunity I'll speak about the first two papers both the uh, uh, Christopher Blair and Austin Wright's uh, you know work on Afghanistan and then um, Graham Blair and colleagues piece that, that he uh, spoke about on uh, the Boko Haram situation and the reintegration uh, evaluation uh, and, and attitudes and social norms. So um, on the, uh, you know, durable solutions, I think, you know, thanks, you know, for raising the, you know, moving beyond durable solutions. This is a critical point. I think it's just, it's very useful to see this graph in the paper on, um, you know, the collapse of what you call collapse of durable solutions. Something at, at UNHCR we're very, um, you know, aware of. Where you can see, I mean, and I was I asked colleagues about this repatriation here, you know, the, where we see some 15% of solutions. That's just, you know, we have to think about: Are we going to be seeing that again in the future with the current uh, crises? So, um, you know, um, and then I think it's also valuable for you to think about. Uh, centering this a little bit more in some of the refugee uh, policy specific pieces like you know the global compact does recognize you know um, that uh, more needs to be done uh, by all to sort of help the uneven um, you know global burden of responsibility and has these four tenets here you know especially around easing pressure on host countries so i think it would, it would strengthen your paper to you know center it this is ratified by the the un general assembly back in late 2018 so you know it's useful to center that that this is you know critically uh, around you know for for policymakers that's been recognized and um you know, there's, a, there's even a piece on supporting uh, conditions and countries or, or of origin for return. So, um, uh, yes. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the results and, you know, um, you know, what, as you described sort of this, you know, as sit, the situation that unfolded on the ground, right? You know, one thing I do think is also, you know, important to note from um, a, you uh, just also on the, uh, uh, you know, in the policy space, it's just that Pakistan, uh, you know, is not a party to the 1951 convention, which is the, you know, founding convention uh, that UNHCR was starting by and, and you know, underlines the principles of refugees. And so therefore they don't recognize ref refugees officially, right? So that they, they, uh, refugees are governed under this Foreigners Act. And I think it would be useful to, um, you know, highlight that a, a little bit in the paper. Um, and then, you know, I just think it's it's useful also to like, you know, this situation that you see in with the, you know, um, you know, this horrific event, in the, Pesh, the Peshawar school massacre that, you know, foments this, you know, very, um, you know, even though no refugee was linked to this, as you, as you rightly cite, that this foments this, um, you know, very critical, uh, revision to the policy on refugees and, and pushes out, you know, um, this voluntary repatriation of uh, Afghan refugees to Afghanistan. I think that, you know, and and, and therefore this, this policy of doubling the cash incentive, I think this is something that happens in other places and it's useful to maybe cite that, um, you know, um, Kenya's one, you know, with the, um, the Westgate mall bombing, you know, and that's, you know, there's even this new Kenya policy on camp closure, which there's been several uh, in the last five years. So, um, <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> right. So, 500 plus thousand return. You know, ha uh, more, you know, 60 percent are assisted by this cash grant. Uh, this is just what the, the what you've described. I did think also it was quite interesting that the um, the correlation work you did on um, how. 2013 returns predict 2016. I think that that's a really strong point in the paper. I'd like to learn more about. Like, uh, it, I think you should, from policymakers' perspective, that's really valuable because if we can help to predict movements and it, just more about, um, you know, uh, you know, how, what, um, 
what were some of the key variables you used in that prediction? You know, what, uh, yeah, the, the more on that would be good. Um, right. Uh, yeah, so this is the main results. Um, <clears throat> So I think that also you, you do a really you know, a novel thing with introducing this, this data set on communal violence, which I think is really exciting and, and, um, and something, you know, we, we haven't, um, you know, seen really before. So I think this is a really no novel aspect of the paper. Um, I know that um, you note the, the challenges with the endogeneity of that data, and I, uh, it's just something I want to recognize. Um, you know, I think also another piece is that, you know, providing cash for, um, repatriation is not new. Actually, it's something that HCR has been doing for a long, long time. Um, and um, I think it would be useful to also highlight sort of the uh, the really uh, difficult situation that the Afghans return to, like just having a summary statistics table on the mean number of, of the different types of violence that you define, I think is really useful, even if it's an annex, just so that people understand you know, the context, I think you do a good job of, of, of describing it. But it's also the paper is a bit long. So you may wish to um, sharpen and limit. And also you may wish on doing some more prioritization of, of uh, results um, and, and or uh, and definitely for both papers, just even putting together some um, short, you know, two pages for policymakers or even videos or short sort of dissemination pieces. So um, let me turn to um, uh, yeah, so I have this other piece, but I feel like I'm running out of time. So let me turn to the uh, piece on Boko Haram, which also uh, was quite, uh, you know, in, in, important for policymakers, the work. So, you know, I think, um, you know, your main message that this, you know, um, by, you know, in, you know, it, this experiment where you have this religious leaders who uh, have this, you know, message around acceptance and forgiveness that this impacts, um, you know, uh, per perceptions of social norms and, and you know, self-reported change, um, uh, you know, in uh, acceptance of these of these ex uh, ex Boko Haram fighters. Obviously, very important for for policymakers, uh, and these are just some of the findings that you've already outlined. So, um, <clears throat> the um, you know, definitely under researched area that we we do we need more. Um, and also the exciting piece about it being it's just really this low cost, uh, you know, uh, information campaign, which, you know, it makes it very replicable for policymakers. So that's also quite exciting. Um, I do think that there's there, something you may, I, you know, want to highlight. I know you, you do highlight this one piece about Burkina Faso that, you know, that finds the opposite results of what you found. Um, but I do think it's worth to highlight sort of the difference between stated and observed behavior because um, that's an underpinning point. And I, and I do think you should, you should nuance your, um, you know, your, your, it, would, it would be useful to nuance your main message here. You know, as I highlighted here, I'm happy to share these slides with colleagues afterwards just about, um, just citing that it's stated, you know, uh, sorry, it's, yeah, versus actual. Um, and then um, <clears throat> just some other uh, notes, you know, you make this correlation that, you know, not only Northwestern or Eastern, sorry, Nigeria, where the, the Boko Haram conflict is, this has this high uh, influence of religion, that there's many, you know, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of people who, billions, you say, um, you know, could uh, be influenced by messages from religious leaders, you know, it'd be very useful for, if you have any commentary of any, anything from the data on, you know, um, further description of, of like, the, the level of trust in these religious leaders, or any other characteristics that define um, what makes, you know, within religion, because not all populations are the same, right? I mean, there's this, you uh, there may be some elements that are worth understanding primarily. So if we were to replicate this, um, that this could be, you know, this could be taken into consideration. Um, right. So, yeah, let me stop there. I think, um, I, I think I'm at time. Teresa, and uh, we will take Azul's uh, comments as well and have the Q&A in the rogue. Thank you, Azul. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to comment on Michele's uh, paper first. Um, very interesting study and it's very commendable that the study is on Libya. We don't have much work on Libya so it's a very good uh, contribution to the literature in that sense. Um, well, I have a um, couple concerns uh, that 
and, and some suggestions about how to address those concerns. Um, two major concerns to begin with, selection bias and reporting bias. <laughs> And error clustering. No, that's <laughs> no, no selection bias and reporting bias. Um, who? I mean, this is a telephone survey. Who responds to telephone surveys is a major question here, and who doesn't respond to telephone surveys? Um, I'm not uh, informed. I'm 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 quite ignorant about the coverage or the usage rates of telephones in Libya to begin with. Uh, so it's very difficult to talk about a random selection here or representativeness at all. Um, and another thing is that it seems a large portion of the internally displaced peoples in Libya had already returned home. Um, so who are these people who are still IDPs and why are they still IDPs when at least two thirds had already gone back? Um, and also, all measures are self-assessed, uh, which brings in the probability of a response bias. These people, obviously, they're not in, uh, living in very good conditions. They have um, um, complaints. Uh, how is that affecting the way they perceive their, their situation, the way uh, they answer the questions? And also, I'm kind of curious, how do they know they had COVID? So, was it just a simple question? Have you had COVID? And they knew? Who diagnosed them? <laughs> um, and also, it's interesting that they also report higher chronic diseases. Can be a sign of, uh, again, a, a reporting bias, an over-reporting. Or it can be a, a reason to, to remain as, a, a, you know, internally displaced, or it can be a reason to suffer more from COVID economically. Um, and also, one thing I strongly recommend, um, I mean, if you can find a way to, 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 to look into it, um, lack of social support can explain a lot of things here. Um, how, how many of these people are living with relatives or with friends or with, um, you know, how many of them have any kind of social network? It can because um, impact both the level of their suffering as well as their perceptions about their suffering. So if you can, um, I mean, all the analysis in the, in, in, the, in the paper are conducted with this one survey, with all with self-assessed measures. So if you can maybe complement the analysis with some outside data that gives us some information about, uh, I don't know, any of these points like um, availability of a social network, um, you know, something that comes from outside rather than from these, the assessments of, of, of the self-assessments of these people. So that'll be my, my suggestion here. But again, I mean, um, very interesting and very commendable because it's on Libya, and uh, Libya is a, is, a, is a major conflict that has so far remained um, almost completely silent in terms of scientific analysis. So um, thank you, and that sounds, it's, it's great work. Coming to your paper. <laughs> um, Again, very important discussion. Um, I mean, the, the, the main discussion about whether refugees carry conflict with them or not is, is extremely important, sensitive, and it's an unresolved discussion. It's an unresolved academic discussion. We have um, answers in both ways. So this paper argues that the effect of, of refugees on the likelihood of conflict in recipient countries um, depends on the ethnic composition on both sides and how that ethnic composition changes with the arrival of the refugees. And they test their hypotheses with data from the Afrobarometer. Uh, my first question or kind of the, the first thing that comes to my mind is about the conceptualization of ethnic polarization and ethnic fractionalization. Um, yes, we can count different 
the number of identities, or we can look at the linguistic distance between them, so we can devise quantitative measures. But unless those measures have incorporate the salience of those identities, I think we are uh, not doing a very good job. Um, if if these identities, if these ethnic identities that we count are not salient for both sides, then why are we counting them at all? Why are we, why are we concerned about whether the number of ethnic groups increase or not? Uh, or, um, you know, the distance, the linguistic distance between them. It, so it all depends on how being a member of a group is defined. And in societies with a dominant ethnic identity, being a member is most probably defined in terms of that ethnicity, that ethnic identity. But in ethnically heterogeneous societies, the definition is most probably something else. Then it becomes important if refugees share those other salient characteristics or not. So we should maybe find a way to, to think about um, fractionalization and polarization in a more broader way. And also, um, the second thing that comes to my mind, again, um, I guess this is a very common comment when you're studying conflict. Endogeneity, the endogeneity problem is always there. Migration, yesterday um, a presenter said this, and I really liked the way she phrased it. Uh, Ana Maria Ibanez, I think she said it. Migration is neither completely forced nor completely voluntary. Um, and there is a lot of agency in migration and in the choice of destination. People sort themselves, they do sort themselves into, into different locations, into different refugee camps. And one sorting criterion might be ethnicity. Several ways to deal with this problem, and they do deal with this problem. I'm not saying that you're not dealing with this problem, don't get me wrong. They do deal with this problem, or at least address it. There are several ways to deal with the problem of endogeneity. We have all been through those, those, <laughs> those ways. One thing is to not insist on a causal argument and just acknowledge that you're talking about associations. There's nothing wrong with that. Or you can go looking for a really good instrumental variable. Or you can try to identify the mechanisms behind the causal association you are claiming. I personally favor this last one because I think that's, that's, that's the best way to go. Um, so that is my main kind of comment for your paper. Maybe look into the mechanisms, uh, conduct a mechanism discussion. Um, so why? I mean, yes, your data indicates a positive association be between ethnic polarization and conflict likelihood and a negative association between fractionalization and conflict likelihood. But why? So at some point you mentioned competition over resources, for example. But competition requires organizational capacity and capability. And I think that gives you a clue about a very important mechanism that might be in play here, which is the unifying effect of salient ethnic identities in a way to enable groups to overcome the collective action problem. So if you can find a way to look for evidence for this, that might be great. That might just give you what you need. Okay. Um, I guess I can uh, give you my other comments later on. <laughs> so I'll just cut it here. Sorry, I tend to talk a lot. I know. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Azu. Uh, who would have questions? Uh, uh, so I see many questions. Uh, but I would like to offer the opportunity of uh, the speakers to respond briefly to the comments, uh, maybe in 30 seconds, if you, if you can. So, Christopher, do, do you want to address comments of Teresa? Uh, in the interest of getting audience questions, I'll just say thank you very much, Teresa. I really appreciate the feedback. I think a lot of the points are, are well taken, and I'd love to follow up with you offline. 
exactly the is same. It's the same. Everybody is the same or no? no? Okay. <laughs> no, no. I was short for the presentation, so I could I can't speak forever now. No, 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 no. But uh, thank you very much for the comments. So I just want to say that uh, I agree about the science. You know, we need to think how to to improve that. To some extent, it's possible that, for example, or we measure polarization where actually it does not matter, right? So, like, I, I still don't know it will affect the result whether it just impose some noise or whether, but I don't know. Um, so I agree with the mechanism. So um, what we have in mind is uh, the, the work by Esteban and Ray, which is a contest model where the price is of public nature. So you have uh, public resources and groups may compete over these resources. So it's really theory, theory driven, uh, or, but I agree that we need to do more on the mechanism. I just want to say something about uh, endogeneity, right? Because uh, I agree with you that refugee camps are never um, uh, randomly located, and w with Philip and others, uh, we have discussed that at length. But I think here we should, I, th I think we should acknowledge that the nature of the selection should be if it's related to ethnic composition, because that, that's why we have this instrument that address precisely the ethnic composition, right? And to some extent, that's true. The, the refugee variable is likely to be the presence of refugees. It's likely to be endogenous. So we control or not for it, like, because it might be also a bad control. But I think really the endogenous issue is about uh, changing uh, ethnic composition. Thank you. Michele, do you want to answer or are we picking? Uh, very quickly, I also want to thank uh, for the Great comments. And I mean, most of the things that you asked uh, are what we'd like to do. But unfortunately, as I said, uh, we have big difficulties in having a comparison in terms of official data. We still try, can try to check for some of the variables, probably. Maybe some marginal variables, we can find some uh, that on transfer, for instance. So just to have an idea. Yeah, some again, external validity yeah, might go we, a long way there. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so now we are opening to the floor. So I see four questions, so I will take four of them. Okay, and we don't have any online or? No, okay. So, yeah, oh. you, you can pass the lady first. Uh, thank you for all the presentations. I really enjoyed listening to uh, them. So my question is for Jean-Francois. Uh, I was also thinking about this mechanism issue and maybe your data is like really not uh, enabling you to do this kind of an analysis. But I just wondered, at least maybe you could show us, uh, I know you're looking at um, uh, sub-Saharan African countries, but maybe for specific regions, for specific countries, you know, you might have different effects. Uh, we are now doing a similar project. We'll talk after uh, 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 with you, with Patricia, uh, where we are trying to find the impact of refugees in Turkey on the ethnic polarizations, and we were checking also mechanisms. Then we see that although like polarization overall, for example, do not have any negative impact, but <coughs> for different ethnic groups it might have. So you know, so maybe you will find also something interesting in that aspect. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Eva Maria. Thank you very much. Um, so I have one uh, question for Chris uh, regarding selection of the returnees, right? So you, your IV is built on uh, exploiting the quantity of past returnees, but not the <coughs> composition of these returning refugees. And what do you think is happening there? And how can that contribute to more or less conflict? And also related to the previous question uh, to the ethnic pluralization. Um, so are we, yeah, are we finding that there is a conflict just transferred from one location to the next from existing ethnic tensions between specific groups or is it a new type of conflict bet because there is this contestant, uh, con yeah, that they are contesting over land and resources like you, your theory suggested, thank you. <clears throat> Krzysztof Krakowski, Collegio Carlo Lamberto. Thanks a lot, wonderful stuff, all of it. Let me tell you two things though. First, uh, Jean-Francois, I have a very similar paper uh, drawing on evidence from tribal Pakistan. And the mechanism that we find is contact. Uh, you know, uh, polarized means probably segregated, means that you don't engage on an everyday basis, so you're a bit more afraid. 
and that which can escalate into conflict. If you see people around, you might be less likely to cooperate, but at least, you know, you realize that they are not as hostile as you might think. I'll be happy to share the paper. And Graham, uh, great stuff. I was just wondering whether there might be some uh, problem of social desirability in a way that you essentially tell people, uh, look, this uh, cleric endorses uh, reintegration, which makes it a bit harder to disagree with that because this becomes uh, a default option. And the second thing is that how common it is that you have such a nice clerics who would uh, be you know, pro-reconciliation. What I found in very different contexts is that a lot of these local leaders, they tend to be pretty uh, you know, antagonist and confrontational. So do you have any information on a larger scale how many of guys like you collaborated with are there in uh, Boko Haram affected areas? Thanks. Thank you. Philip? Yes, so my, my first question is, is for, the, for the Pakistan paper. By the way, I want to congratulate the, the four presenters for their very interesting uh, paper. So, um, as you said, uh, there are high amounts that they, they get, uh, $400 per individual, uh, 3600 on average uh, per household. So, uh, can you make sure that after a few days they, they cash the money, they go over the border, maybe they return uh, to, to Pakistan very, very soon? Uh, is there any evidence of that? And, and maybe they even just cross the border to collect the money and then go back. Is there a strong registration system? Is there controls upon arrival? Are you sure that the same household and individual does not collect the money twice? All these, I think, logistical questions are also essential uh, for your paper. And then for, the, for Michele's paper, I, mean, uh, I think it's very commendable that you do the Libya research because we have very few papers on Libya, but I share um, Azru's uh, comments and, and suggestions very much. And maybe uh, if you we ask COVID questions, one question could be to be more precise about is, have you been tested uh, by, to get COVID and yes or no? Uh, have you been diagnosed of having COVID? Not just uh, do you have COVID, because many people, even in well-informed Western populations, don't know if they have COVID. Yeah? They have coughing, they, they maybe have fever, they, they maybe have other things, but uh, how can you really be sure that you have COVID is only when you are tested. Otherwise, it's self-assessed, self-reported, with all the biases uh, that you have. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, we have three minutes three minutes left. So, Christopher, I will uh, give you the, the floor uh, briefly. And uh, um, for the people here, uh, I will ask to answer very briefly. We will be able to continue at the coffee break. So, Christopher. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. So, first to to Anna Maria's question. Um, yes, the I should clarify the instrument is combining the the kind of time series national level inflow with the historical resettlement pattern. So I think we pick up some of the kind of geography uh, of resettlement there or uh, of re repatriation there. Uh, but in, in the appendix, we also show a result that leverages uh, distance to the encashment centers in Afghanistan. And that, that also is like a kind of a different uh, geographical, geographical measure for exposure to returns. So, um, do more in the paper than, than I could present today. Um, but you, you might find that of interest if, if you take a look at the draft. Uh, and thank you for that question. And to, to Philip's question quickly, yes, there was a biometric process involved here. So everyone was fingerprinted as a way of pre preventing duplicate um, you know, access to, to the encashment. And, and so follow-up surveys suggest that you know, the, the vast majority of people stayed in Afghanistan, at least for 2016. Thank you very much, Braha. Thanks so much, Chris, for the question first about uh, social desirability. I guess I, I think there are, there are two things we might be worried about. One is that you're you're, you're asking uh, kind of about a sensitive uh, a sensitive uh, behavior, and so people might might not want to answer honestly after hearing that the um, religious leader uh, shares has a has has a different view. 
Um, I guess I've become increasingly uh, skeptical of the existence of that. Um, we have a meta-analysis that we did last year um, that shows that in most areas, except for attitudes towards authoritarian regimes, towards the leaders of authoritarian regimes, there's very little detectable social desirability bias. But I think you could also be worried about, about kind of demand effects, that, that you've learned what the um, purpose of the experiment is from the perspective of this leader, and then you might want to follow him. And so I guess a couple of thoughts on that. One, we don't find effects on, on all outcomes, so it doesn't move your, your anger towards these groups, which is something that was directly targeted in the message. He shared ideas about forgiveness from, from these religious texts. Um, and so I guess I, I take that as, as some small evidence about, about um, the fact that it, it, it's not just that we're moving in all of the directions that are suggested, and it's really just in these uh, norms and, and behavioral, uh, behavioral intentions. Um, and and I, I guess lastly, the way that you put it, um, I liked, which was, you know, the leader told you to do something, and so you're saying that you would do it. But I think, I, I almost think that that's kind of the part of the mechanism. Um, that that is going on here. So certainly we'd want we 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 would want to um, it, it collect uh, behavioral evidence that that sh demonstrates that this uh, shows up in in actual behaviors. But I think that if you saw that there um, that that the desirability is almost what this uh, leader cue mechanism is is part is partly about. So thanks for that. Do you want to address some answers or comments? On no, no, I just want. Thank you for giving me this <laughs> task. We will try to, to fill the gap as much as possible. Okay, thanks. Jean-François. Uh, yes, so I think uh, many of the comments are actually related to your comments. To, uh, I can try to make a parallel. <laughs> no, but about uh, ethnic heterogeneity, uh, ethnic group heterogeneity, I think it's a good idea. Maybe it can stress the issue of science, uh, science, sorry. So, sorry for my English. Uh, yes, uh, so I think that's a, that's a good idea. I need to check for the data. Um, I, I didn't know about your work for Pakistan, so it's very interesting. I think the way to go that may join your comments about mechanism is actually to exploit much more heterogeneity. Uh, so we, we don't have much information about the refugees, but at least for the local population, that's a bit what we got with the unemployed when you use individual data, but maybe we can do much more. Uh, to try indirectly to highlight some mechanism. And the transfer of conflict is a very good point. So we control for conflict spillover, but this is another issue. We control for the fact that you have conflict next door. But I think for transfer of conflict by refugees, it's almost like if we were doing the reduced form of our estimation. Like the, the IV is actually... Uh, Taking into act, is, is capturing those ethnic groups that are coming from uh, areas with a high level of conflict. So there might be something to do, but I, I need to think about this. But thank you very much. There, this is a great su suggestion. Thank you. So we are running out of, out of time. Sorry, if you have extra question, I propose we continue the discussion at the coffee break. I would like to thank really the, all the speakers for their original work and uh, all the, the comments, the commentator for their constructive comments and, uh, and uh, thank you for this interesting discussion.